Should we read the Word of God this morning? Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to take you to the account of uh, Abraham. It is right at the very beginning of, of, of the, the Bible. And Abraham has just been given the promise of Isaac. Uh, Abraham and Sarah have been infertile for many years. They were, they were struggling with barrenness and God gives them the promise uh, at an old age, out of an impossible circumstance to conceive a child by the name of Isaac. Isaac has now been born. He's probably about 11 or 12 years old. And we pick up this account here in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. I don't know if you want that kind of relationship with God. He calls you my name, you just respond. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Genesis 22, verse 6. So Abraham took the, wo the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, Dad, he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? How many of you know that is a very good question? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Can we go, give God a big shout of praise for that passage of Scripture? Because it's got a really powerful ending to end it. Grab your seat. This morning we want to say, a uh, very big hello to our court gathering. We love you guys, and we're, we're streaming to you at a, at a different uh, time zone, but we love you guys, we're thinking about you, and also to our Phnom Penh English service as well. Happy New Year. We love you guys. Uh, today, I want to speak to you a message, uh, which I, I actually really struggled across the, 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 the break to, to compile, because I really wanted to put together something really fun. But uh, the Lord just kept pointing me back to preaching truth. So is that okay? I I'm under no illusion that this message today is a bit of a crowd thinning sermon. It's not necessarily the, 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 the kind of sermon that will draw large crowds, but it is a sermon that will set you up for the coming decade. Is that okay? And so we're using this passage in the book of Genesis uh, with this account with Abraham. And I want to speak to you on the thought when no one is watching. When no one is watching. We see this account here where uh, uh, I, I, I just, I, I'm just as a bit of a, of, a, of a preface for you guys, if you're a note taker, you will find yourself furiously taking notes today. And if you feel like you're missing a few things, just dial into the podcast when it comes online on Tuesday morning or watch the YouTube clip. But we see that God has this conversation with Abraham. And I genuinely believe that God continues to have the same conversation with humanity that he had been having with Abraham. And he begins to talk to Abraham about coming to a place where no one is watching, watching, where no one is around, and surrendering the things that are the closest to his heart. When we come to the start of every year, when we're starting a new season, when we, like now, we're starting a new decade, we all make plans. There are desires of our heart, things that we want to see happen, experiences we want to have, goals we want to achieve, things we want to step into, you know, places we want to go, and all of those sorts of things. And I want to encourage you guys that all of these things are good. And, and, and you know, we, we have this, this, this idea in our heads of, of different things, if you're anything like me, as we look forward, this, this banner of good things that we want to have seen achieve and things that we've got planned. How many of you are planners? The rest of you just wing it. Come on. You guys are planners, right? It's under this banner of, of good things. And, and under this banner of good things, there's a whole range of things. The things that, that, that God has actually spoken to us about, that, that, that has lit a fire of desire in us to be able to, to, to see happen. And there's some other things that, that we feel that God has spoken to, about, to us about, but He really hasn't spoken to us about. It's really us talking to ourselves about it. And there's also the other stuff. There's also good things, but God definitely, we haven't prayed about it. We actually haven't even talked to anyone about it because if we did, we fear that they're actually going to say, don't be ridiculous, right? But there are all these things that, that, that we have as our plans, as our things that, that we desire. This one thing that I know, at the start of every season, one thing that I know, the Lord keeps come, bringing me back to this truth that whatever it is that is of God, if it is to unfold in front of people, if it is to unfold as something that people can see as evidence of something that is good, that has happened in our lives, that is of God, it will inevitably have to be surrendered in the privacy of of our own heart when no one is watching. What God wants to unfold in your life when everyone's watching will need to be surrendered to Him 
when no one is watching. Here is Abraham, right? And for the longest time, him and his wife, Sarah, had been desiring to have a child. And how many of you know that when you have a child in your 90s, that is very difficult to hide? That's a lot of explaining to do. God actually gives Abraham and Sarah the desires of their heart. It's a very public outcome. But in this place in Genesis chapter 22, God has asked him to surrender in private what is a very public outcome. So here is Abraham, and, he, and God says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, your only son, whom you love, just to rub it in, the one that is very close to your heart, and I want you to take him to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is a place where living things go and they don't come back. It is a mountain that everybody in those days understood was a place where people built altars to offer burnt offerings. So Abraham immediately knew when God said to him, take your son Isaac and a very big knife and be prepared to build an altar of burnt offering. And I want you to go there to which Abraham actually said, okay, God. Now, I don't know about you, but that is actually a response that very few of us would have given God. How many of you would actually say to God, God, I have some questions. How many of you say that to God? At the very littlest things. God, I have some, but wait, can we talk about this? But Abraham tells his son, son, we're going to go. Bring your mother's knife. And we're going to go out to Moria. It is an odd response because on the way up the hill, the son says, Dad, um, we're going up to Moria, right? Yes, son. Uh, usually people go up here, they bring either a goat or a lamb with them. Where's our lamb, Dad? To which Abraham said, son, the Lord will provide for himself for the altar that we're going to build. That is an odd response. I reckon the only logical conclusion that we can come to about why Abraham could even say that, come to a place of total surrender and trust that God had Isaac in hand, was because he knew his God and he walked closely with him. Can I submit to you today that the closer you walk with God this year, the deeper your surrender will be? Because intimacy and a close walk with God is the breeding ground of trust and you can't surrender if you don't trust God with your year. You can't surrender if you don't trust God with your decade. You won't surrender if you don't trust God with your plans, your agendas, the things you want to see. Come on, have I got a, have I got a church that I'm talking to today? And here, see, see this, this, is, this is what we need to understand about what was going on. And if, if there's anything that I want to lead you to at the start of the year, and trust me, I wrestle with compiling this message for you because all I wanted to do was create a message that would give you a big G up for the coming year. But the Lord said, lead the church this decade to have a posture of surrender. Lead them to understand the value of surrendering when no one is watching. And when they do that, tell them, I've got their decade in hand. And here is Abraham, and he leads his son to a place called Moria. And this is what you need to understand about surrender. It always begins here. It always begins here. And this is going to change your theology, your understanding about surrender. I reckon the, one of the reasons why we struggle to surrender is that we think surrendering actually means losing things, actually giving it up. The reason why I think Abraham had no problem surrendering Isaac was he knew biblical surrender is not giving things up, it's laying it down. Think about it. Biblical surrender is not giving it up, it's laying it down. Can I submit to you this thought? You can have it all, just surrender it all. This year, you can have it all, just have it surrendered. What am I saying to you? I'm saying that you can say, God, I have this wealth, but this wealth won't have me. I'm going to have it and have it in a surrendered manner. I've got my marriage. I've got my kids. I've got my share portfolio. I've got my career. I've got my plans. I've got my purposes. I can have it all, but I'm having it all in a surrendered manner. Here is the value of surrender. Surrender ensures that you can have the desires of your heart without the desires of your heart having you. 
That's the reason why Moria happened for Abraham. Because God needed to know that Abraham could be entrusted with Isaac, that he would have Isaac, but Isaac wouldn't have him. Because it was so much more than just having another baby boy to bounce on your lap and to fill this void of not having children. Isaac was the promise to birth nations. Come on, are you out there? Maybe, just maybe, the desires of your heart are in there because God wants to use you, your family, your marriage, your business, your house for a greater... Come on, am I speaking to a church? You can have it all, but none of it will have you. Surrender ensures that you can have the desires of your heart this coming decade without the desires of your heart having you. See, the best you is a surrendered you. Do I get an amen? There is nothing God can't give to a surrendered heart. There is nothing God won't entrust to a surrendered heart. There is no blessing, no favor, no opportunity, no accolade you can't handle when you actually have a surrendered heart. Imagine a million buck check handed to an unsurrendered heart. That'll ruin that person. Imagine a sudden acceleration in profile, in wealth, in, in, in opportunities, in, 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 in favor, in blessing to someone who is unsurrendered. It'll wreck us. And God loves us too much to give us more when we haven't surrendered. Do I have a resounding amen? The best you is actually a surrendered you. That word Moria, that Mount Moria literally means the place chosen by God. I believe for every single believer, if you want to walk with Jesus, God chooses a quiet place in the space of your heart, your own moria, where you will have to do business with God for all of your plans, your purposes, your desires, all of the things that are closest to your heart, where you have an opportunity to lay those things down because the best you is a surrendered you. And you need to understand surrender doesn't mean losing or giving up. It actually just means laying down. You can have it all with none of it having you. Do I get a resounding amen? Is this helpful to you guys? You know, at its very core, why this is so important and why I wanted to start the year with this really important message is that the surrender of the heart is actually at its very core discipleship. At its very core, this is a discipleship message. In the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is an account of a conversation that Jesus has with somebody. We don't know his name. The early Bible translators simply title it the rich young ruler. He, Jesus has a conversation with this guy. We don't really know his game, why he bounded up to Jesus and why he had the kind of conversation he had with Jesus. We think, some scholars actually think that, that, that he was actually looking at the 12 guys that, was walking, that were walking with Jesus and he was envious of them. He wanted to roll with Jesus. He wanted to be like the 13th disciple. You know what I'm saying? Like he was, he was potentially someone that was highly educated, probably someone that was, if, if he was a rich young ruler, potentially being part of the Roman Senate. So he would have looked at all the 12 guys and go, these guys are clowns. There's like a fisherman there. There's like a tax collector there. Like I'm, I should be counted amongst the, the, the disciples of Jesus. And so he bounds up to Jesus in Mark 10, verse 17. And he says this, now he, he being Jesus, was going out on the road. One came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to Jesus, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. (laughs) Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way. Sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word, a bit like a few of you are sad at this sermon today, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Wrongly exegeted this scripture, people have often talked about how Jesus had a problem with money. Jesus had no problem with money. We see that in other passages of scripture. What did Jesus go after? Jesus went after what was closest to this man's heart, that he was unwilling to surrender. This, this guy said, Jesus, can I roll with you? I want to be one of your disciples. I want to be one of your bros. Can I just, can I hang out with you, right? To which Jesus says, if you really want to walk this discipleship life, you need to be able to lay it down. Jesus was interested in what this guy couldn't let go of. In 2020, it might not be earthly possessions like this rich young ruler because most of us have not much. But what is it for you? What is it for you that you're holding on to that you can't surrender? 
What is it that you that you're holding on tight? That God, God, I I I lay down a little bit, but I'm not willing to go up to my moria for you. See, surrendering is simply choosing to lay down what's good in order for God to entrust us with what's best. <laughs> Come on, do I get a resounding amen? To this man, it was, it was earthly possessions, but to, to other people, it's, it's, it's different things. You know, it's, it, it, it's, is it the desire to, to, to find a partner? Is it a desire to fall in love? Is it, is it a desire to, to have a new career? Is it a, a desire to, to be more recognized, to have better profile, to have more Insta followers? What, whatever it is, the, the very things that are important to us are the very things that Jesus asks us to surrender because He wants you to have it. He just doesn't want those things to have you. Do I get a resounding amen? This rich young ruler, he behaved rightly. He, behaved, he, he, he thought that, 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 that surrender looks like behaving right. But Jesus said, no, 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 it, it's not about your behavior. It's about your surrender. Religion requires that you live right, but grace requires that you live surrendered. That's the difference. For some of us, we think that just because we tick off a few boxes, we, we live surrendered. No, Jesus goes after your heart. Your life might look messy, but as long as you're surrendered, eventually your behavior will follow. Start with the surrender, not the behavior. Come on, are you out there? Jesus wanted to lead this rich young ruler to a point of surrender because Jesus knew that his best life was found not in trying to live right, but to live surrendered. Do you understand that the more things we have in and around our lives that are not surrendered, they become more strings that our lives become attached to? Like puppets on a string. How many of you have that imagery in your head? You know what a puppet on a string is? Yeah? So we have all of these things, right? We've, we've got our kids that we just helicopter over and we want to try and control. We've got our career. We've got our house that we've saved up for 20 years to buy and we finally bought it. We've got our routines, our holidays. We've got all of these things that we have in our lives. You know, we've got our car. We've got our share portfolio. We've got our career path. We've got our marriage. We've got our ministry and all of these things. And if we have those things and we allow those things to have us because they're unsurrendered, they become puppets. We, we become a puppet with those things becoming strings attached to us. Make sense? And so for so many of us, we've lived entire Christian journeys like puppets on a string. So all the devil has to do is have a little go at one of your unsurrendered areas, like your finances, and suddenly you're twitching. He's just playing with you. You guys are getting real quiet. Has a go at your marriage. Has a go at your kids. And so we go through our entire Christian journey as Christians, sometimes like this. Dancing to the tune of where the enemy has to go because we make 2020 the year where you cut those strings. No strings attached. I'm surrendering all the, maybe there are some strings that you've already cut. Cut them all. Cut them all because your best you is found in a surrendered life. If you're smart, you're catching on that this is actually the key to your greatest freedom. The Christian paradox is that a surrendered life is the key to your greatest freedom. The world tells you, if you want to be free, do what you want. Chase all of these different things. But the paradox of Christ is that if you want to live free, you want to live unencumbered, not a puppet on the enemy's string, then cut those strings and say, God, I have them, but they don't have me. That way the enemy can have a go at your money. You can say, go your hardest. It all belongs to Jesus anyway. Come on, are you out there? He wants to attack your body. Say, I present myself as a living sacrifice. Have a go at it all you want. You can't get to me. Come on, are you out there? You can try and attack my house. You can try and attack my time. You can try and attack, come on, my emotions. It's all surrendered to God. How many of you want to live that way in 2020? If you want to receive the infinitely more, why don't you just infinitely surrender? Time and time and time again, year after year after year, God is too kind to give you more Isaacs, only for those Isaacs to have you. He's too kind. He's too kind to entrust you with infinitely more when you haven't infinitely surrendered. Why would He give you more strings to the puppet of your life only for you to be twitching through another decade? Come on, do I get a resounding amen? Can I go a little deeper with you? At the start of every decade, I always say to God, God, I want you to check my heart to see who has it. It's a great question to ask. Who has your heart at the start of 2020? Who has your plans? Who has your agendas? Do you have a life or does your life have you? 
Do you have an agenda for your life or does the agenda for your life have you? How many of you feel sometimes like your life just overtakes you? Are oh, you guys getting so quiet? I'm going to talk to this group. Of, come on, you feel like your life overtakes you. Just stuff, right? Like, what? How did that appear in my diary? Like, what? How did that appear in my schedule? Like, what? How did that, that commitment? Come on, you feel like your life just overtakes you. How about we just live? So, you can have it all, but you just got to surrender it all. The account of Abraham and Isaac was a really powerful account. Because it foretold of the greatest surrender ever made in human history that paved the way for us. Matthew chapter 26 is an account of Jesus in a place where no one was watching in a garden called Gethsemane. Jesus, for those of you that don't really know what the Gospels are all about, it accounts for a 33-year period in time where fully divine assumed form of fully man. So he was fully divine and fully human for a little window of time. Make sense to you guys? All of the Gospels account for this Jesus as man in man form, completely aligned with the Father. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. Make sense to you? I only say what I hear him say. And so he was completely aligned. But for one little snippet in the Gospels, we see the human Jesus at odds with the Heavenly Father. Right here in Gethsemane. It says, Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. This for, the, for some of you that, that feel that Jesus don't understand what you're going through, Jesus felt sorrow. He felt distress. He understands, right? Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Now, verse 39, very, very important. Catch this. He went a little further, fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me or this responsibility pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What? Jesus is saying, I want something different to you, father. In this moment, what I want looks different to what you want, but I surrender my will to yours. Make sense to you? Here is Jesus, and he's saying, I surrender what I want. I would rather, Father, not have to endure a Roman crucifixion. I would rather not. In fact, if you ask me right now, the completely human person in me is deeply distressed and sorrowful. I would just much rather not have this responsibility. I want to go back to Galilee, start my carpentry business, get my builder's ticket. It'll all be sweet. And he says, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Let me give you some theology around this, right? Here is Jesus. And he is doing something incredibly powerful in a garden where no one is watching, called Gethsemane. At the very genesis of humanity, there was another garden called Eden. When God created humanity, Adam and Eve, He created them in His likeness. Do we all agree that? So you're not descendants of monkeys. Can we all agree? God created you. You are created in His likeness. And the distinctive that He created you with, that set you apart from all other created beings, is a fully formed will. He created you with an ability to make choices, to make decisions, to feel things, and to think for yourself. And the only way that God could see that Adam and Eve would live at their very best was for them to live in complete harmony of their will surrendered to His. Make sense to you guys? And so for autonomously thinking and willing humans to function, there had to be a premise. There had to be an existence of choice. And so God said to Adam and Eve, you can eat of any fruit tree in the garden. I would highly suggest you eat from the tree of life because that's where the, your life source is. But from one single tree, do not eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There had to be a premise for, for will to be surrendered. Make sense to you guys? And so we all know that the serpent, the enemy comes and begins to suggest to Adam and Eve, hey, why don't you think for yourself? Did God really say that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll die? Why don't you, come on. That's a, that's, a bit, that's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? Why don't you think for yourself? Why don't you do what you want to do and see how it goes? 
Why don't you try? Be your own man. Be your own woman. Are you following me so far? Mm. Why don't you try? Be your own man and be your own woman. To which Adam and Eve stepped out of that surrender place and took their own life in their own hands. And so you need to understand, the curse of sin was introduced into the world, and the curse of sin at its very core was actually the curse of an unsurrendered life. That's why I'm preaching this. And at the start of every year, at the start of every season, at the start of every step forward to us, at the start of every era, God always leads me back. Because God, from that moment on, when... Even Adam ate it, and sin entered in the world. The curse of an unsurrendered life entered into humanity. God put together a plan to rectify and reverse it. Catch this. What started in a garden where no one was watching, called Eden, was reversed in another garden where no one was watching, called Gethsemane. What started with an unsurrendered life with the first Adam finished with a surrendered life with the second Adam so that every other person from that moment on can come back without any religious work. Come on. Come on, without the blood of bulls and goats. I need a resounding amen. And simply surrender their heart afresh so that all of the things that God wants to have for our lives we can have but none of those things will have us Jesus was the ultimate and first surrender and when you surrender you reverse the bondage of an unsurrendered life and step into the life Jesus died and rose again for you to have I need a resounding amen what started in the garden all those puppet strings began to be formed. Finished in another garden where no one was watching. All those strings were cut. So that you today, at the start of a brand new decade, can walk and say, God, I have all of these things in my life, but I lay it all down. I can have it all, but I'm going to have it and steward it in a way that is completely surrendered to you. So many of us want the glory of Calvary without the surrender at Gethsemane. One doesn't come without the other. One doesn't come without the other. When Jesus, when they were done with Jesus and they nailed him to a cross, they had pulled his beard clean off his face. They had beat him to the point of being unrecognizable. They had whipped him with cat and nine tails. They whipped, tore strips of flesh off his body. He was stripped naked, humiliated, and he didn't say a single thing. The next time you hear what comes out of his mouth, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Completely abnormal response. How does a man, a fully human that feels pain just like we do, get hung on a cross, and the first thing that comes out of his mouth, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He didn't surrender at the cross. He surrendered at Gethsemane. Come on, are you out there? We all want the public victories. We all want the praise reports, and we're believing that for you. We all want the breaks. We all want to see you fulfill your plans, your goals, your ambitions, your experiences. We are, I want you to have all of those things, but can I suggest to you, Nations Church, 11 a.m. service, cork and, and put on pen, it all begins because you're prepared to walk up that Mount Mor Moria. Come on, are you out there? It all begins because you're prepared to have your own Gethsemane moment where you surrender all that is yours to Him. Now, we understand Galatians 2. Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is now no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. How many of you want that to be your life for 2020? Musicians, you can join me. Come on, why don't you stand to your feet? Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise? Just stand to your feet right across this room for a moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now it makes sense. What Jesus said to his disciples, now it makes sense. Matthew 16, verse 25, Jesus said this, that if you don't understand surrender, you will never understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, whoever wants to save or hold on to their life, they'll lose it. But whoever loses or surrenders their life, for me, will find it. The greatest paradox of Christianity 
is completely different to what the world tells you. The world tells you to get ahead, you just got to get ahead. It's a game of survivor, right? But in the kingdom of God, the greatest paradox is you can have it all as long as you lay it all down. I'm going to lead you in just a moment, in a very holy moment called communion. And I will explain to you the significance of what we're about to do at the start of this year in this first service in just a moment. But if I could ask right now for every person to bow their heads and close their eyes just for a moment to respect what I'm about to say as we shift gears for a second. If you're here today and you've actually never experienced what it's like to ask Jesus to come into your life, or maybe you believed in Jesus, you called on His name once in your life, and you find yourself in this season of life far away from Him. For some reason, you've wandered away. You don't even know what you believe anymore, but today you want to recommit your life back to Him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to lead you in prayer today. There's nothing religious you need to do. You just need to respond in your heart. But you do need to acknowledge what I'm about to ask you to do by simply lifting up your hand. If you're saying, yeah, that's me. I want to ask Jesus into my life. I want to get my life right with God at the start of this year and start my journey with God in relationship with Him. Ask Him to forgive me of what I've done. Free me from shame and guilt, those things that are holding me back. And to be assured of where I'll be should my life end tonight. If that's you today, I'm going to count to three. All you need to do is shoot your hand up so I can acknowledge you. And I'm going to say a prayer with you today. Is that you? One, two, three. Just put your hand up so I can see who you are. I want to pray with you. I see that hand over there. Thank you, sir. Very brave of you. Wonderful. Anybody else? I see that hand over there. Well done, sir. Thank you so much. Two incredible young men. Anybody else? You want to say yes to God? You want to invite Jesus into your life? There's one hand there, another hand there with two hands. Is there a third hand? Is there a third hand? The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that He is saved and He rose again, that He, that he died and He rose again from the, from the dead, you'll be saved. Saved from a life that is distant or separated from Him. And that, my friend, is a great brand new life that's in store for you. So come on, we're a family here. So let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that from this moment, you have come into my life as my Lord and my Savior. Lord Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of all that I've done and wipe away all of my past. And Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and you rose again for me to have a new life in you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a big shout of praise.